Hi, welcome to a special edition of Education Matters. Uh, this is Lessons Learned uh, Through the Pandemic. Uh, I think uh, when I talked to both of our guests, I guess it was late summer, I mean, uh, early summer, uh, we all had preconceived ideas of what the school year was gonna look like. And I, I think uh, we've learned a lot since then. So, and I have picked two districts that I think are um, unique and geographically very different. I have Sarah Bellotti uh, from the North Warren uh, School District up in uh, obviously Warren County and the Appalachian Trail goes right through it. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, thank you for having me. And then I have Kenyon Cummings from the Wildwood, Cit Wildwood City School District, which borders the, the Atlantic Ocean and it is flat. So uh, welcome, Kenyon. Thank you, thanks for having us. Good afternoon. Uh, so Kenyon, I'll start with you. Um, what were you, I mean, first of all, you're going through this, and I should say for both of this, you're going through, when you were planning for this, you didn't have increased state aid, you had decreased state aid, if uh, I understand that correctly, right? Uh, correct. Sarah and I met each other. Uh, we were part of an advocacy group that was uh, losing funding because of the cuts within S2. So there's some kinship there in trying to make some economies and uh, make the district run a little bit more efficiently. And then I'm sure we'll get into it, but there are a lot of things that obviously increase our costs. Um, so we had to kind of plan for that and make sure that we uh, were able to cover those margins, which some of the additional monies that assist with that from the CARES money, um, digital divide money and things of that nature. Okay, uh, Sarah, I did briefly describe, and I probably stole some of your thunder by talking about the Appalachian <laughs> Trail. I know you like to bring that up, but just give us a, you're a seven through 12 district. Yes, and that, that is my favorite thing to say because it really does aptly describe the community. Uh, it's a very rural community. We're really proud of the fact that the Appalachian Trail runs through. Uh, the whole top of our school district actually is, is flanked by the Appalachian Trail. And it's, it's, a, it's gorgeous country up here, very mountainous. And unfortunately, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned, we're, we're losing a lot of money under S2. So we left last year looking at a $700,000 deficit. We're looking this year to about a million dollar uh, deficit over last year over state aid cuts. So we're, we're dealing with this in a way that's creative and that we're trying to be very mindful of, of the money that we have and the money that, that is left for us to spend. So Kenny, how did you approach September? Were you hybrid, remote? How were you uh, uh, when you first opened your doors in uh, uh, September? Sure, I'll rewind a little bit. So uh, we are exit four at the bottom of the state in Cape May County. We're an urban pre-K to 12. Uh, we average around 850 to 900 students. Uh, locally, we're about 90% free and reduced, so that qualifies us for a CEP. Uh, we're a community eligibility provision, so everybody eats subsidized in Wildwood. Um, so there's a lot of things to think of there. And we also have a very large bilingual Spanish population. So there were some things that we needed to um, anticipate in that we were not future ready when we closed. The, obviously, we didn't have a lot of funds. Any uh, devices we had were because of donations and outside monies that had come through. So uh, we needed to get to the point where we were one to one and we needed to figure out what was going to work for our community. So we started in the summer meeting with all stakeholder groups. We had meetings with the parents. We had meetings with the faculty, extensive admin team meetings, uh, a very busy summer. Overall, we really wanted to get an idea of like how everyone was feeling as far as safety. First of all, like how are we going to introduce students and staff back to a safe environment that's going to be as healthy as possible? And then how are we going to approach the academics on top of that? So where we arrived after many, many surveys and many, many meetings and many, many um, changes in course was we opened in an AA virtual BB model. So we split into two cohorts. Uh, a group comes on Monday and Tuesday in a typical week, and then we're all virtual for Wednesday for more extensive cleaning, and then the B cohorts in on Thursday and Friday. So uh, part of that were some of the things that we discussed before, like how are we going to handle masks? How are we going to handle expectations of teaching in this new um, paradigm, which was new for everyone, myself included. We're kind of building the plane in the air. Um, so some of the things we did, uh, we changed policy in terms of dress code for faculty, and we incorporated language in the, about masks in our actual policies, uh, which also flows into the handbooks for students. So we updated those as well. So the mask requirement actually became a part of the dress codes throughout the district, because that was a big concern was just compliancy. Um, we also wanted to anticipate the needs of our faculty in that 
uh, we had not had an expectation pre-K to 12 for using these virtual environments. So we, we, again, surveyed the staff, tried to see what their needs were, what was their comfort level using Google Classroom and Google Meet. And we scheduled a series of uh, virtual PD sessions for them because we wanted them to be successful with a whole new set of expectations if we were even going to use the plan. Because at the time, we weren't sure if it was still going to be green lighted by the state to open. Um, so we did that. But then when there was also an issue with uh, whether or not the parents were going to be able to navigate these these arenas. So we put together a series of uh, information videos for parents that were bilingual um, on how to use Google Meet and how to use Google Classroom to kind of uh, guide their own students and their children in the home. Um, and then we worked towards uh, surveying connectivity issues. And that's been a huge challenge to try and figure out who can really connect and not just connect via a cell phone, but connect uh, through a robust connection and that's not through a hotspot or on an iPad or a tablet and making sure um, we're able to reach our students and they're able to reach us. So uh, right now where we are, we just had a recent closure of two schools and they're open again, but the uh, we're really relying heavily on the teachers in those virtual settings to communicate to us who's not checking in, who's not able to access. And um, there's been some fine tunings along the way, but overall, well, wow, we're really proud of our plan and it, uh, it got us to November 30th without any hiccups. So um, it's gone well, but I, I really attribute that to the planning process being 100% inclusive. I don't think if we didn't involve the whole school community across the board, including the municipality, um, that it would have gone the way it has. Uh, Sarah, I know you, you kind of did the same comprehensive plan A, B and C, I guess, uh, looking at all the different scenarios. Uh, how did it go for you in September? Yeah, similarly, I, you know, we credit our success so far with the fact that we got our stakeholders involved early on, including our students. Um, one of the things that we identified in August that concerned us was that we had a large, we had done a survey with the students and we had a large percentage of students who said they were unwilling to wear masks. And so we got some stakeholder groups together with those students to say, what would make this easier for you? What would you know allow you to buy in? And the feedback that we got was that if we didn't put restrictions on the masks, so for example, in the area we're in, um, a lot of the schools in our area were ma uh, mandating that students wear solid color masks only. And our students were very uh, nervous that we were going to implement a similar mandate. And once we learned that, that was very important to them. Um, you know, they're not allowed to wear bandanas and they're not allowed to wear gaiters. They have to wear a mask. But as far as that, as long as it's not offensive or disruptive, they can really wear whatever kind of mask they want. And we have a, a small group of kids. And I, I say this smilingly because I think it's, it's clever and we're a high school. Um, we have a small group of kids who wear masks that say, I'm only wearing this mask because you made me. And I'm like, you know what? I am totally cool with that. I think it's great that our kids have a voice that they wanted to express themselves. And guess what? Every student every day wears a mask and we've had zero issues with, with mask compliance. And that was one of our, our bigger fears opening up. Um, and I think it's because, you know, we know our community, we know we have really good kids um, and they, they wanted to have that voice and they wanted to have some sort of expression with it. Um, so that, that was something that we, we took to heart very early on was let's, let's find out what our students want and, and what our community um, is looking for. The other thing we realized right away, we made so many course corrections to our plan. Um, it was, uh, you know, the plan that we started with on September 1st had already changed uh, slightly by about September 15th. We made another overhaul on October 1st, adding in a lot more one-on-one uh, in, uh, -on -one instruction uh, during the school day. And then we are now actually in the process of reinventing our hybrid model. We're doing the same, you know, similar thing where Students are coming in two days a week on, in half sessions. And when we come back in January, we're actually looking at um, revamping that again. And the reason that we're doing that is we got feedback from parents, from students, and from teachers that said, we can do this better. And so we tried to listen to that feedback and, and, and look at what are other schools doing? What's the research showing us? Because the one thing that we noticed early on, we did our fall benchmarks um, in uh, the end of September. And we got the scores back. And so by October 1st, we knew that our students had not lost ground. So our benchmarks from this September were the same as they were last September. We just got back our PSAT scores. We do universal PSAT uh, administration. Our PSAT scores are unchanged from last year. So our instructional practice is working. 
And so whatever we can tweak with regard to what this looks like when you're on site, what this looks like when you're virtual, we're trying to be mindful of, of giving teachers voice to, to tell us what they would rather do and what they would, would like to do better. And we're being very flexible. And, and obviously we're not making confusing changes, but we're making changes to, to meet the needs as they evolve. And the one thing that we've learned, and, and Kenyon mentioned this, you know, we're building the plans where we fly it. We've learned that we, ha we have to make course adjustments um, and we have to be flexible and open to that. And, and I think that this really comes down to being flexible and open to listening. Um, and that's, that's kind of where we are with it. We're trying to listen and we're trying to just continuously do what's best for, for our students. Um, this is this has been very difficult for them. Um, you know, I've said to, to my staff a couple of times, I don't know that there's a more traumatic event in our students' lives than, than this pandemic. And we have to be very mindful um, of that trauma and that response. And, and let's see, how can we support them and how can we help them? So it's been it's been a lot of flexibility and a lot of, you know, trying to adjust as, as much as we can. I, ha I probably should have mentioned this to you earlier. What about the staff? I mean, we talk, I mean, they weren't taking classes on doing remote instruction or hybrid instruction. Uh, and you pretty much had to learn this overnight, uh, almost literally. Um, how has your staff, I mean, I know you, both of you have been very inclusive in your, in your planning. And I think that's a, if you're not inclusive, you're not going to have success, but uh, how has your staff re, uh, responded? Cause I know I had a couple of teachers tell me it feels like their first year of teaching. Um, so Kenyon. Yeah, we, we've had the same response and uh, and we're sympathetic to that. We've had bits and pieces of this training over time as it became um, more prevalent at the use of the technology, but I'm not surprised by it because we do have a really incredible faculty here, but going back to the spring, they were already figuring out ways to reach their students, even with all the obstacles that we had. We didn't have a device for every student. We didn't have like a, a standard platform that we were using. Some teachers started with Zoom, some were trying Google Meet. And it, it was kind of like we had to catch up to them and then learn with them and figure out what their needs were. But they were already taking the initiative to try to figure out how to connect with their students to begin with. Um, so yeah, that has been the challenge. And similar to what Sarah was saying, um, we're now looking at like, what are the needs now? Like now, now that we're into half a year, uh, we're actually talking about how do we assess what we've done so far within a half a year that we've been able to control. The, the spring was a surprise, so we were, it was reactive. We had the opportunity to build a plan this summer for the fall. So it's almost like we're going to embark upon a research study with a, a PLC with our students and our school community to figure out what we need to do um, as we begin the second semester, which is uh, basically the last week of January. But something to be uh, sympathetic to, and also Sarah mentioned, just the trauma of this, it covers all domains and all groups. So our admin team, obviously, we burnt the candle at both ends all summer long. That's usually a time where they're able to recharge because they're in the buildings all year long during the regular program. We're here in the summer planning, but they do have the opportunity to catch up with family and tie up loose ends. But we went straight through the summer to get ready. Um, and also just the, the general malaise caused by the, the conditions that we're living in now. And we're all making it work, but I think that uh, we've just come, become accustomed to that, to not seeing our families as much, to missing out on events, to watching our own kids. I'm an eighth grader, watching his experience in middle school be disruptive. So those things are something that I think that we need to be remaining cognizant of because that trauma is affecting us all as we try to fine tune and have a robust education program and pay attention to the, need, the social emotional needs of the students. But I think we have to be sympathetic to our own as well. Sarah, what about your staff? I know you uh, did a lot of collaborative work with them. Yeah, we, uh, last spring, like Kenyon said, you know, last spring was very reactive. Um, and last spring we were able to capitalize on some existing professional development that we had had planned and we immediately flipped it to how to teach in a virtual model. And so we tried to give our staff the resources that they would need to do this efficiently so they weren't spinning their wheels and they weren't reinventing their wheels, but also in a way that gave them help and support because this is, no one, you know, no one signed up to teach in a, a, a charter school, a cyber charter school. Um, nobody signed up to teach as an online teacher in my district. And now all of a sudden, this is what we're doing. Now going into the fall, you know, just, just like Kenyon said, now we're, we're trying to be a little bit more proactive. And so we've really worked with our, we have a skip committee 
um, of teachers and we have an academic review council who advises us. And we've been trying to work with those teachers to really pinpoint and fine tune what is the professional development that you need? Um, what can we do to help you? What can we do to leverage this? And we've also been trying to add in some things for fun. Uh, we've been running uh, virtual trivia nights and virtual bingo nights for our students, but we're also running those for the staff. And we had a, a very cutthroat uh, virtual trivia night with our staff about a week ago. That was a lot of fun. And it was just a, a nice way for us to connect and to do something a little bit less serious because we're missing out on that. We're used to having lunch together every day. We're used to seeing each other in the hallways, having coffee, passing. All of that has been kind of taken away. And so we're trying to find ways, how do we rebuild those relationships? Um, you know, one of my core philosophies is that communication and relationships are what makes our schools successful. And we've had to find ways to do that in this virtual environment. So we're trying to think of things that are fun and, and things that are relaxing. We're going to do a, we always do a variety show uh, the day before winter break. It's a school-wide variety show. It's a hoot. Um, and we actually are, are working right now. Um, somebody volunteered, uh, a video production company that's local to our area volunteered to help us produce it. So it's going to be a, a, a somewhat professionally produced variety show for our whole community. So anytime that we can capitalize on something that is showing a little bit of normalcy, but also giving us a chance to take a breath and relax. The other thing that we're doing, um, obviously, uh, you know, with, with the date that's today, we have a, an impending storm coming in two days. We sent out a letter uh, yesterday saying to families, if we get 20 inches of snow, this is going to be a snow day. Please take this opportunity to go and play in the snow with your family. It's, that's such a low risk activity. Um, we have so many, you know, things we can't do. We can go play in the snow. We're not going to do, uh, we're not going to do instruction uh, in two feet of snow, go, go outside and play. So anytime that we can capitalize on that, we're trying to capitalize on it. I'm not sure how much snow Kenyon's getting. Uh, I don't think he's getting 20 <laughs> inches. <laughs> you we're will always great. get more snow, that I know. Uh, Kenyon, uh, Sarah talked, uh, touch on it, and you to also touch on it, the social emotional well-being of the students and the staff. How, how have you been dealing with that? Because that's a tough, you know, she talked about a couple of things she was doing. Well, I'm, that's not a unique thing to schools to begin with. Like we've already been really hyper-focused on that to begin with, um, especially with some of the uh, challenges that our students are uh, resilient in navigating. Uh, but we wanted to try and make sure we had something a little bit more, um, I guess I'll use the word robust again, um, in approaching that. So what we did was we, for the virtual Wednesday, because we did have some time uh, with some of our um, counseling staff and nurses. We created a uh, district-wide core team. So our full child study team led by our supervisor of the child study team, along with the nurses in district, uh, the guidance counselor and our student assistant counselor. They are going through uh, and working with the faculty. So there's a referral system coming through if students aren't checking in or they're noticing changes in behavior, whatever red flag may be going up this group of professionals who have been here for a long time and they're very committed to our students. Um, they've been meeting every virtual day that we've had, uh, which is usually one once a week to go through that case list and recommend interventions. And then they're taking time to make phone calls, schedule um, meetings with parents after hours. So I know that there's one going on this evening at 6 p.m. because parents are working and they're concerned about uh, their child's uh, outcomes right now. So uh, that's something that I'm, that came out of one of the planning meetings that's been really effective and that we're really proud of. Sarah, do you have anything to add to it? You talked about a, a few of the things. Anything else that you would want to add to about the yeah. social emotional? I think the only other thing we would add is, you know, our counselors have been working on this around the clock. Um, they've been working on it all summer um, because we do have, have kids that are at risk that we need to, to think about and that we need to plan for. And the one thing that we're looking at right now, our first marathon period closed a couple of weeks ago. Um, we're actually right now looking at a plan to bring uh, students who are at risk of failing uh, into the building more often. So the norm right now is for students to be on site two days a week. We're looking to see if we can utilize some other spaces in our building because resource space resources are hard for us. And we're looking to see if we can be creative with space resources to bring those kids who are in danger of failing on site more often again, to get that personal connection and that relationship building. So I think, you know, we're, we're all trying to just be creative and think about how can we make sure that no one, no one does fall through the cracks and that we're reaching out to the students who need that one-to-one -one connection. Uh, 
The other key to probably success is the communication with the parents uh, and getting the parents on board to help with maybe not, even just not sending their kids to school if they're, they have a fever. Uh, Ken, you, you did touch on almost everything you did, you did bilingually. Um, anything else that you did to communicate with your parents to get them on board and how your parents been? Yeah, we, we just, we tried different things and this has been something that uh, has been a challenge over time. But uh, where we landed, it seems like the most effective means for us right now is to use our all call system to use a text message. So we're able to embed the translation in the text message. And then we've been linking the text message to the district letter in Google Drive. So that seems to be really effective. And then just as like an extra layer of effort, we've put the same letters up on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and the website. And we've emailed it for parents whom we have email addresses for. So we've really kind of exhausted every pathway that we've had. Um, I think the all call system with the phone calls, I think there's a fatigue associated with that. And we've even had parents say, as soon as they hear one of us on the line and they recognize it's a recording, they just hang up. So the, the, the text message has had a much better response so far. Okay, what about you, Sarah? Yeah, the one thing that strikes me uh, when I think about how we've changed communication is we, up to last spring, we always had a policy that when we posted things on our social media, we didn't respond. And it, we even have a little blurb on our social media that says, you know, you can comment, but we won't respond. And our, our practice had been, if someone was really, you know, seemed lost, we would call them. Um, we realized in the spring that people were so hungry for information and that parents were, were so stressed about what was happening and trying to plan that we changed that policy. And we now respond to questions that come up on our social media. So if we post the link to a schedule and there's 15 questions from parents about the schedule, we actually answer those questions right in the link. So that way, any parent who clicks on that link can see our answers. They can see the questions that were asked. Um, and it's been very well received. And I think that what it's done is it's helped us to communicate more quickly. Exactly what, what Kenyon was saying. You know, there's a fatigue associated with getting all calls and having to look for letters. Um, and so for us to have that one-on-one -on -one connection to say to a parent, we see your question, here's our answer. Even if it's repetitive, sometimes we would post the same answer four or five times. But I think that it helped us to just kind of bring down the temperature, make sure parents had the information they had in any means that was helpful to them. So that was a really big change for us because up to that point, we had never considered um, interacting on social media in that way. But I, I think we're going to continue it because it's been helpful. Um, it's been very, very popular with parents. We've had parents say, thank you so much for taking the time to answer it here. Um, and I think it's really just about our families are really stressed out. Anything we can do to take that note off the board for them, give them the answers they're looking for, we're trying to, to meet them there. Yeah, I think we kind of always forget how stressed out all the families are uh, mm -hmm. during this difficult time. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, where are, where's your district now and what are you thinking about you have to change? Because I think we have a spike going on right now after Thanksgiving. Um, can you work? What, where are you now? Where do you see yourself in January? Any tweaks you think you, you'll have to make in January? Well, we're currently open. We had a, a, a brief closure in two of our buildings uh, on November 30th. So we were very happy that we made it to November 30th. And then we did just a, 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 out of an abundance of caution, we closed until December 10th. So right now, our for whatever reason, we're not having the, a big challenge with faculty. Like that seems to be what's driving um, closures in our county. Not like not an unwillingness to be there, just like exposures that are happening or positive cases and just not having the physical people to run the program safely. So, so far we've been able to cover and we've it's been a challenge in places, but right now our goal is to stay open if we can. Uh, we were one of the last areas to flip to orange in a high high rate in uh, in the maps that are coming out from the health department. Um, we're hoping that that'll trend similarly, but at the same time, we're not going to be reckless. So uh, right now, we're lucky in that our county superintendent and the health administrator from the Department of Health is meeting with our roundtable weekly when the maps come out. So there's a lot of dialogue that happens there. Um, so just moving forward, like I said earlier, I think that we need to assess the effectiveness of the plan that we have right now 
and we need to do that together. And then if any changes happen, those will happen in the new year once we're able to really look at it and look at the data that we have. And um, I'm really interested in the uh, experience of the students because I think that we really need to get an idea of what their reaction is. And um, we've definitely seen some engagement issues, especially on the independent days uh, when they're on their own and they're having to self-motivate with whatever assistance they have in the home. So I think we need to get to the root cause of what's driving that and figure out if it's an engagement issue, if it's a scheduling issue, if it's a professional development issue that we have to work on. Uh, we know what the outcome is. We just have to get to the bottom of it. And then those changes will come from there. Uh, what about you, Sarah? Uh, did you feel the spike a little bit more? And I know in a high school district or middle high school district, it's harder, sometimes harder to replace staff if they have a COVID or whatever because of the specialty. Yeah, we, uh, we similarly were very proud that we didn't need to close until Thanksgiving. Um, and then out of an abundance of caution, we closed for the, the two weeks following Thanksgiving. And unfortunately, uh, we had a, a spike in cases that necessitated us to make the decision to close uh, until after winter break. We really were trying to think about what's best for students. And we thought that an on, you know, coming in one day and then having to close unexpectedly the next day uh, would be harder on families than making a decision to just close for the, the two weeks um, leading up to break. Um, and I think that was a smart uh, decision because we still are obviously getting uh, data on the positive cases that we have in our in our district. And we, we would have had a lot of on and offs. It, it's very hard. It's hard to cover. It's hard to find teachers. Um, once a teacher has to quarantine, um, it's very difficult to find a, a subject area teacher that's qualified um, you know, to teach that subject. So I, I think for us, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, you know, but again, we don't have the child care or equity issues. We have one-to-one -one devices, students who didn't have internet, we were able to, to provide them hotspots. Um, so we didn't, we didn't feel that um, we would be putting students at a substantial um, disadvantage based on their socioeconomic status because, we, you know, we did have that. And, and there's not child care issues like there are in elementary schools. I think if we were in elementary school, we would likely have a, a different approach to these next two weeks. So. It's, it's been hard. I, I don't think there's any right answer. There's certainly no magic bullet as to what's the best way to do this. I think we're all really looking at the needs of kids, um, the health needs of kids, the academic needs of kids, and, and the emotional needs of kids and trying to figure out how can we be consistent for them and how can we be predictable for them and how can we help support them. Um, and that's what's been kind of driving, you know, the decisions that we've been making is how to how to do that and how to do it in a way that's that's reasonable. We've gotten great feedback too. Our students uh, like our full remote schedule. We've gotten a lot of feedback from students that it's it's um, it's giving them some independence that they appreciate. And um, you know, like I said, we're we don't have the childcare issues that an elementary school would have, but we also are getting feedback from parents that you know they they do still need to help their kids and they need to remind them and make sure that they're that they're logging into Zoom. So we do recognize that this is a strain on families. So, uh, you know, like I said, I think it's just a lot of whatever we can do to help. Um, we're we're trying to to do that. Well, I I think you're right, and I think as Kenyon said, I think you in the opening that we're building the plane in the air and uh, we're all learning as we go along. I want to thank both of you. I think the one thing that you did learn is the process of being very inclusive, bringing everyone together helps you move forward together. So I want to thank both Kenyon and Sarah uh, from the two different parts of the state uh, dealing with the same bit difficult issue. Uh, and I hope uh, a lot of you learn from that. So that brings us to the end of this uh, uh, Education Matters, uh, Lessons Learned During the Pandemic.